as he was saying, my name is Dante Miller. I'm the co-founder of Village Micro Fund. We're a social impact fund that sits on the west side of Atlanta. And we have a mission to create as much opportunity as there is genius in black and brown communities. Um, but the reason I came here today was to really speak about cryptocurrency, uh, because quite frankly, my friends are tired of hearing about it, are tired of hearing about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I want to take you through a bit of my journey, uh, tell you about a few of the revelations I learned along the way, and then tell you how that's relevant to our topic today, which is cryptocurrency. So I like to start this story with talking about my grandmother. My grandmother was a home cook, and she was the type of woman that could really bring together neighborhoods. She could feed like the entire neighborhood off of like a dozen eggs. It was crazy. And everyone would always come to her asking like, why don't you have a restaurant? And the response was like, you have restaurant money? Um, which, you know, we never really did. So growing up, I just couldn't understand. One, you know, she has this amazing ability to cook. She could make food stretch. She'd be the only restaurant within miles. Um, but I know now that the reason that she couldn't get investment is because she was a poor black woman in a poor black neighborhood. And not only that, but she only had a third grade education because she had to mother her brothers. And that was the reason why, you know, she had this great, you know, a skill in cooking. And this is exactly why she was so good at what she did. But this is also why no sophisticated investor would ever look at her and say that we want to take a chance with her. Right, so this kind of led me on a journey to just think about money in general. Um, so this journey led me to Morehouse, and at Morehouse, I uh, kind of got directed to the Federal Reserve, because where better to learn about money than where they actually make money. So I had a few revelations at the Federal Reserve that really blew my mind, personally. Um, one was that the Federal Reserve wasn't actually technically a federal institution. It's not a part of the government, and that's crazy considering that literally half of every transaction that happens in this country is essentially governed by this institution. And this institution has a monopoly on money. And that's crazy once you think about inflation because our 2% inflation rate every year means that our money loses 2% of its value every year. And what this means was that the wealthy, sophisticated investors, they can essentially put their money into other things like real estate, like stocks, like bonds. And because of that demand, it artificially raises that price. So on one hand, you have rich people investing in rich things and getting rich. And then on this other hand, you have the communities that are most reliant on cash, which are poor communities, that are consistently losing 2% of their value every year. So what this creates is without any policy involved at all, you have the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And the second thing that I really learned at the Federal Reserve that kind of blew my mind was the fact that money isn't real. <laughs> like, <laughs> at, at one point, you know, it, it was tied to gold, um, but it hasn't been, you know, really since the 30s. Um, how many of you have seen the, the Wizard of Oz? You know, you know that story is actually an allegory um, about the transition from gold and silver coins to greenbacks. And you see, in the original book, uh, Dorothy had on silver shoes, and she was marching down this yellow brick road, gold, to Emerald City, which is the green place where the wizard is supposed to live, and he's supposed to be this great and amazing figure, and then you look behind the curtain and realize he's a facade. That's our dollar. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so in getting frustrated with that piece, uh, I moved on to my second part of the journey, which was Wall Street. So I got to this prestigious Goldman Sachs space, and um, this is where I learned about markets and intermediaries. So essentially, we pay these institutions a lot of money and give them a lot of power um, because at the end of the day, we don't trust each other enough to transact. So we can both say that we trust this institution in the middle, you know, and that is how you have all these you know, intermediaries form, and that is basically what Goldman Sachs does as a bank. But here you learn, like, do you really trust these institutions? At the end of the day, we know that, you know, because of financial manipulation, we've already had a recession. Um, you also know that, in general, uh, when it comes to accounting, you can play with the numbers. There's a lot of opportunity for that to go bad. Um, so the question is, at the end of the day, in a world where public faith has is basically at an all-time low and has eroded to the point where 
we don't really trust our institutions anymore. Where do we go from here? So generally, you see things go from faith, like the church, to institutions, which is like the government, to now I feel like we're coming to data. So how we fix this problem is essentially, funny enough, in the uh, height of the recession, you had something created called Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. And what cryptocurrency is, is really three parts. One part is a coin. Another part is actual blockchain itself, which is the technology that allows the coin to work. And the third part are the miners or the computers that actually process and verify those transactions. And once they verify those transactions, they put them in a block. This block is attached to a chain of blocks. And that chain, uh, every block on that chain is dependent on the one before it and influences the one after it. So basically all this means is that you can't change any block without having changed every block, which makes this at the end of the day a lot more secure than a lot of the banking software that you really use. Um, so what cryptocurrency really solves, I guess in one sentence, is like the double spend problem. When you send something online, it doesn't go straight from me to you, right? There is a group of about six or seven people in between that transaction. So like when you send something online, if I send you an email and I have an attachment, I don't lose that attachment just because I sent it to you because what I really sent was a copy. The reason you can't do that with money is because money would be counterfeit. That's why you have to have those six or seven people that sit in between that make sure that transaction actually goes through. But every person on this transaction takes time and every person on this transaction takes money. So that's why it takes three to five days for you know certain things to process these receipts. But what cryptocurrency does is automates this entire process. So now it allows for things like smart contracts, which are basically auto-executing contracts. Once we put the terms and conditions, we can put our money inside the contract like it was a bank account. And essentially, whenever these things are finished, it automatically executes and just wants that. So now we can get to the part where we really came to talk about today, which is the use cases. Um, most obvious use case, we were just talking about contracts is legal. So there are companies like iLaw, which are currently taking a mixture of smart contracts as well as uh, artificial intelligence to really create either free or very cheap legal services for people that can't afford it, for to uh, open up access to legal services. You also have like 30% of the world's population is unbanked. So what does it mean where as long as you have access to Wi-Fi, you have access to a bank account and you can essentially manage that without having to go through all the fees that are associated with banks? Um, a second place that may surprise you in terms of use cases is actually, I'm gonna say art and social. So imagine as a someone that does music, as an artist, you could essentially upload your ma cause at masters onto the blockchain because the blockchain doesn't really apply to just money. It applies to anything that's valuable that can be kept online. So let's say you put a song onto this blockchain, you could really set a smart contract to automate your royalty fees. So now every time someone plays, like you can essentially streamline that process and don't have to go through a lawyer every time. Uh, another option is taking the social route, which is essentially, before on social media, it didn't make sense to do micropayments. Uh, for you to tip your friend like 10 cents, it would still take those same six to seven people involved in the transaction. And that just doesn't make sense because that's a lot of labor, right? But when you streamline this process and allows a computer to do it, it all of a sudden opens up the possibility for a lot more things, things like tipping. So imagine if some of these viral videos that, you know, kids that were producing viral videos online actually, instead of getting likes, got tips. Now all of a sudden they can make, you know, an actual freelancing opportunity off of this. Now they can use that money to actually have a budget to produce real and better projects. Um, another part I wanna talk about is essentially food and land. There are a lot of implications in terms of land just because um, at the end of the day, what a blockchain is, is a database that you can't change. You can't go back and affect. And why this is important because you have situations like with Morris Brown and Clark Atlanta that happened last year. Essentially, Morris Brown was selling one of their buildings and Clark Atlanta bought the building first. And then the city of Atlanta came behind them and apparently bought the same building because there was a mess up in records. So as a result of this, there was this long and lengthy 
legal battle that ended up with Clark Atlanta actually owning the property. But I'm sure they would have liked to, preferred to have just have not gone through that court process. So what does it look like if you can actually store documents on the blockchain and have instant access to see who owns what? Um, there's also another option in terms of renting your house out. What does it mean for all these abandoned properties um, that are on the street? What would happen if you could essentially, uh, a lot of investors are purchasing these properties and just sitting on the properties because they're afraid for while they're rehabbing for people to come in and essentially take things out. But if you actually had someone living in the house, that wouldn't be an issue. And that would create a lot of opportunity for not only people to get homes, but also for people to improve neighborhoods. Um, there's also situations in which you have urban farmers that need land and you have these real estate developers that have a bunch of land. What would it look like if you could lease out your backyard to one of these urban farmers and make that streamlined? What would it look like for these urban farmers to essentially be able to look in a database of other urban farmers and be able to see what they have and be able to trade back and forth using bartering? And then the last but not least use case that we have um, that I've decided to look at was really um, lending and financing because that was the part that really interested me the most. You see, when we first started Village Micro Fund, what we really wanted to create a market what was a market. We wanted to create a market for small businesses to be able to go and find a place to find investors and for investors that wanted to invest specifically in black businesses to have a place where they could go to invest in those businesses. And when I heard about the abilities of cryptocurrency to suddenly turn that from a hyper-local situation to an international situation and essentially be able to connect international communities that will really be you know, focused around cultures and brands rather than states and borders. Um, so I guess the question from here is like, where do we go from here? Um, one, I'd like to see more conversations about cryptocurrency happen more often in spaces like this, where there are you know, a lot of like-minded people who are out to do social good. Because a lot of times you hear about cryptocurrency in the context of making money. And yes, it can make you money, but this technology has implications that go way beyond just making money. It could really change the way that we transact online and change the way that we include different people in our economies. So I say all this to say, um, I had slides that I completely forgot to use. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, at this point, we're supposed to be like at a context <laughs> like, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, from here, uh, I guess I would like people to do a bit of research around cryptocurrency. You can find coinmarketcap.com, which is a free resource for cryptocurrency. We can go and do studies on them. Um, invest in cryptocurrency to help some of these new uh, startups and ideas really get the capital to actually pursue some of these problems that they're really going after. And also just see how cryptocurrency can really advance what you're already doing and apply it. Um, I think that's about really all I had to say. Um, but yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.